Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Vyshalis. I'm an Urban Development Associate with the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. And on behalf of WRI, C40, ICLEI, and the World Bank, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> this is the first webinar of our series exploring sustainable and integrated development through diverse topics. Sustainable and inclusive urban development is more than just a vision. Adopting key measures such as integrated urban planning can and does translate a vision into reality. The Global Platform for Sustainable Cities, or GPSC for short, brings together participating cities and a wide range of entities that are working on urban sustainability issues to create a shared platform for global knowledge and an evidence-based integrated approach to realize very worthwhile outcomes. This series is part of that platform. <clears throat> so before we get started, I do wanna say that this webinar series is made possible through generous funding from the Global Environment Facility. Uh, WRI, C40, and ICLEI, uh, the consortium, uh, we make up the resource team and we are working in partnership with the World Bank in support of the Global Platform for Sustainable Cities. <clears throat> For this first webinar, we will learn about a stakeholder engagement tool developed to help cities take an integrated approach to improve mass transit by providing better first and last mile connectivity. The main questions that we will cover in this presentation include, what is the importance of public consultation in the planning of a station area? What are the principles of safe access? And how can the safe access tool be applied in your city? Our speaker today is Rajiv Malagi. Rajiv is a senior associate with the Urban Development and Accessibility Team at WRI Center for Sustainable Cities. His work focuses on transit-oriented development projects to create safe and better living environments around transit nodes. Uh, he leads the Safe Access and Neighborhood Improvement Program, and he is also an anchor for urban development work in Kochi, Hubli Darwad, and other Indian cities. His work includes formulation of proposals, interaction with local stakeholders and city officials, and assistance to governments in the re review, design, and development of projects. Thank you for joining us, Rajiv. Rajiv will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and afterwards there will be time for questions and answers. So please make use of the question section in the chat box um, to add any questions or comments. And with that, I will now turn the mic over to Rajiv. Thanks for that, Tada. And thanks for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, it could be good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. And um, thanks a lot for joining this webinar. <clears throat> and hopefully this would be of some use to your work or your studies or whatever it may be. So um, my topic for today is enabling safe access to mass transit. And it's basically um, an engagement and a decision making tool. And um, I would want to give a, sort of a precursor uh, before I start my webinar about two things. Uh, one is uh, uh, since I am based out of India, and uh, my work has been focused around India. Um, so most of the examples which have been used here are primarily uh, with the Indian context. Having said that, uh, since we have done one or two workshops in an international context as well, we have very realized that this is as much as uh, applicable to contexts around the world um, as equally as the Indian context. And we have uh, seen that happening, and I would explain about that in the later part of the presentation. And uh, secondly, um, with respect to the safe access, it can be seen as an independent entity. And with our work in WIR here, uh, this safe access falls under the larger umbrella, umbrella of uh, TOD, which is the Transit Oriented Development. And this is one of the tools which we use for public consultation workshop. Um, I would get into details of this in the later part of my presentation, but I thought it was it is important to sort of set the context um, of this particular presentation. Okay, to start with, um, I would like to highlight a few examples uh, here uh, of the users of first and last mile connectivity. 
around mass transit station. So let's say, uh, let's take an example of this person called Suresh in Bangalore, where he says that uh, I prefer riding 40 minutes to office than taking the metro for 15 minutes. I don't like bargaining with the auto ride from my house to the metro. So here he faces this problem of constantly negotiating with the uh, uh, feeder, uh, feeder systems here, which are the auto rickshaws, uh, where he, we, they have to negotiate the prices depending on different times of the hour. So uh, it's, they just don't run by meters, but uh, if there's a P car, they end up charging almost one and a half to two times the fare here. So he is tired of doing that and he rather prefers to spend an extra extra few minutes, extra set of minutes um, on road on his bike rather than taking the metro. Taking a different case of this lady called Leela Ben in Ahmedabad, which is in the city in the western part of India, uh, where she says, as much as love taking BRT bus, which is the bus rapid transit system uh, here in Ahmedabad, um, I struggle to reach home every day as I have to walk through dark isolated roads in the night. So as secure she feels in the bus, uh, which is a public entity here, which has really good, done really well in terms of pro providing this public access to the city, it equally feels unsafe for these women to walk to their houses since the streets end up becoming dark and isolated and they don't feel secure to walk along these streets. Shifting from um, a commuter's perspective to a, a, a service provider's perspective where uh, this person called Babulal in Delhi, he basically uses this uh, cycle rickshaw, which is basically a non-motorized rickshaw and he has been cycling for the last 20 to 30 years now. But the problem which he's facing in the recent times is there are these introductions or introduction of e-rickshaws, which is the electric rickshaws, as well as, uh, you know, petrol or diesel operated uh, feeder systems. And he has to constantly vary his prices uh, to come here to uh, transport people from metro to residences or workplaces because, you know, the because of the fares of these e-rickshaws and other autos which are present there. So he has to constantly compete with different modes of uh, last mile connectivity and accordingly fix the prices. So it's not just the commuters who are sort of facing this challenge, but also the service providers in the area of last mile connectivity. So having said that, uh, looking at the current scenario of station access, station, when I, I mean, as metro stations or any of the uh, mass transit stations here in, in, in different cities, uh, the cities are basically investing millions of dollars in creating these kind of mass transit. But what happens is they often uh, uh, are unable to achieve their full potential because of poor first and last mile connectivity. Uh, when I say poor, it's basically a lack of infrastructure lack of proper provision of certain elements or it could be lack of larger network systems of these last mile connectivity and which is actually leading to these kind of unsafe access to the transit systems. So what eventually has to be done is the, the primary need for the safe access around this tran uh, transit station is that there needs to be a safer and seamless access uh, you know, around these mass transit stations to not only discourage the private mode of transport, but also to encourage the public transport over here. The bas basically, the focus is that we just can't look at, you know, these big bulky mass transit stations and designing that and putting in money in that, but we also have to start thinking towards giving proper first and last mile connectivity solutions for this. Secondly, this just can't be an infrastructural approach where we just say that uh, uh, we have done enough uh, number of footpaths or cycle tracks or any mode of last mile connectivity, but it also has to be an experiential approach, uh, uh, which ha actually has to add life uh, to the whole area there. With that, we get into the safe access uh, to mass transit, where um, I get into my flow of presentation here where uh, the presentation is, is going to be in four parts. 
the first part is basically talking about safe access in the con context of transit oriented development like i mentioned earlier where we talk about what is transit oriented development and what is the livable station area and how wri has been approaching the idea of transit uh, transit tran transit oriented development here i'm sorry uh, and finally how uh, the safe access tool uh, fits in as a public engagement tool uh, the second part is going to talk about the idea of safe access itself and the different principles which we have developed over time based on our research um, in across different uh, fields and finally what is the need for this kind of um, tool the third part is going to talk about the reality check where we are trying to say that this tool was not just designed as a research tool but it was actually designed uh, to be applicable on a real case scenario and uh, applicable to real conditions on ground uh, be it uh, you know different demonstration sites or it could be even you know training different professionals i'll, I'll definitely get in detail of that later and finally concluding the, the overall presentation based on that so okay coming to the first part where we are talking about the idea of transit oriented development uh, what is defined here in the Indian, Indian context is it's basically uh, involves uh, creating concentrated nodes of moderate to high density developments, supporting a balanced mix of land use around transit stations. Um, uh, one point I want to mention here is uh, uh, there's equally a need to sort of uh, contextualize this transit oriented development. So when we talk about moderate to high density developments, it, we are not talking just about increasing the amount of built form uh, and making it concentrated like it is always uh, seen in a global context. Let's say if you talk about the context of India or China or any parts of Asia, uh, basically we have a lot of densities already existing around uh, transit here. So it could be also talking about moderate to high density of people primarily rather than just being the development. So as long as we achieve different kinds of uh, densities required to support or use the mass transit, we have achieved our goal. So it need not be a development bit always. So given uh, a broad understanding of this, uh, let's say if we have a metro uh, or a BRT system here as a mass transit, uh, we are, if we talk about a radius of about 500 to 750 meters um, around this particular mass transit, and then talk about creating high densities around this, that's what compromises as a station area, which we call it as, which encompasses this kind of concentrated development in a walkable distance of 500 to 750 meters. And if we start creating these multiple station areas around each of the mass transit, that's what basically forms the transit oriented development zone. And when we come to the next part where how WRI is mainstreaming this kind of transit oriented development here, uh, we have done that in three parts. Um, I'm sorry for the last um, uh, text here, it, it's basically design. Um, first part talks about the regulatory frameworks. The second part where we are dealing with is the finance, where we are talking the aspect of land value capture and how to develop finance around a transit oriented development. And finally, the last part is the design bit. So if we talk about regulatory frameworks, uh, WRI India over time has developed different kind of documents it could be a developing policies uh, around transit oriented development or it could be uh, the transit oriented development manual for example we developed that for uh, the delhi delhi uh, city in india uh, where we developed different kind of guidelines on how to achieve successful tod around mass transit stations uh, there's something which i want to highlight that uh, currently uh, the metro policy also regulates um, has mandated the idea of transit oriented development and which has to be considered by all the cities who are developing and building metros in India here. And I assume that most of the cities um, in other contexts around the world are also focusing this. So we thought it was quite important to sort of address this aspect um, of creating these regulatory frameworks. The second part is the financing bit. Like I mentioned earlier, we are doing a series of workshops 
and uh, sort of discussions uh, and research practices and studies around uh, the financing bit here where we are focusing the aspect of investments as well as the uh, land value captures and creating different tools of how to do TOD finance. And finally, the last part, which is the design bit, where we have not only just looked at research and developing policies, but also looking at how we could uh, use this uh, whole study of TOD and, and safe access approach into the aspect uh, of design uh, <coughs> uh, in the TOD work. So let's say the first example, this was done uh, where we created the whole sector of transit oriented development we did this whole sectoral planning um, under the case of the city called naya raipur and it was a greenfield development approach uh, the greenfield when i mentioned it means uh, that uh, we taken we have taken a, an open area or an unplanned area outside the city context and we did this whole development um, of uh, based on the current transit uh, system which exists there and how to rework based on the existing resources we have over there. For example, the blue patch you see was the um, existing water body and then and, and the central line you see was the mass transit line. So how do we look at concentrating developments with uh, you know, uh, respecting the existing resources and the landscape which is available over there? Uh, zooming uh, in from a neighborhood level scale to a street level scale, uh, this is one uh, example of a city called Hubli Darwad, which is uh, in in the northern part of uh, the Karnataka state here, which is basically in the southern part of India, uh, where we focused on two aspects of uh, transit-oriented development, which is the safe access and public spaces, where we said that in the proposed uh, bus rapid transit system, where you can see an, uh, a yellow building towards the left top corner. That was the proposed BRT line. Uh, what we basically did was created a series of plaza as well as streets and public developed streets and public spaces um, in the range of uh, 500 meters to say that uh, as much as important to design the BRT here, it is equally important to design streets and approach uh, to this particular BRT. And this was taken up uh, as a demonstration case um, when they were when the city was designing the BRT. And currently, uh, it has reached the tendering phase, and it, it's very soon very soon go is going to see uh, the light implementation here. So, having said that, we we have it is very becomes very critical to approach transit oriented development as a people centric approach. Uh, when I see people-centric approach, it means to say that we just can't look at this whole process as a planning approach where we have these experts and uh, different implementing agencies and the government sits together and sort of plans and designs this whole transit-oriented development. But it equally needs to involve people of the city as well as the neighborhoods uh, to in the, in the whole planning process and take their opinions and suggestions and, and see what best they can do uh, which actually leads to something more contextual and applicable to people rather than just becoming a mere um, a mere plan which is more infrastructural in nature like I mentioned earlier. So uh, to achieve that uh, we have designed the safe access tool uh, where it is an effective engagement tool and it actually helps to formalize and organize strategies uh, for the station area and finally it prioritizes you know all the stakeholders of the area and this came through our research and understanding of what people needed um, in these kind of station areas or neighborhoods. So coming to the tool itself uh, where we talk about this being a public engagement tool. Firstly it, it, it's important to understand what is safe access. Uh, safe access is basically uh, creating safe access conditions for users of the station area. Uh, when I say safe access conditions, it's basically to prioritize access of pedestrian, cycling and public transport. It's as simple as to say that if I have a given metro station or any kind of transit station in my city, and if I'm staying in a range of 500 meters to one kilometer um, around this transit station, how am I going to reach this? And that's precisely what uh, safe access does. 
so if you see this as an example uh, where uh, if you the central blue dot is a mass transit and the outer line uh, is drawn in a radius of about 500 meters to 750 meters where we call this particular area as the station area so the station area is basically a place of connectivity where different modes of transportation come together uh, and it not only just becomes a place where these modes meet but it also becomes a place where people could work, live, shop and play and all of these activities can happen together. So it basically becomes a neighborhood by itself and not just an aspect of last mile or the first mile. And coming down to the five principles, so the whole safe access approach and uh, the manual, the safe access manual which we have developed uh, it's it's a, a big research document of about 200 pages, which we, it started with that, where uh, it was developed on the basis of these uh, five principles. Uh, if, if I start from the left side, where uh, the blue one, uh, it, it is basically the pedestrian and cycling priority to start with. And secondly, enhanced public realm, which talks about public spaces in the neighborhood. And then it is seamless integration of feeder network, networks and infrastructure. It's basically the feeder systems and the last mile connectivity. And then it's the parking management and enhanced safety and security. I'll get into details of this. Uh, the first uh, principle, which talks about pedestrian and cycling priority, uh, it focuses on creating safe and comfortable pedestrian and cycling infrastructure and services. Uh, and it also talks about interconnected neighborhoods and city networks. And to, to broadly talk about that, it not just focuses on creating the infrastructure, which could be footpaths or cycle tracks in the station area, but it also talks about creating a larger network of these systems, uh, which has to be done in this, but it has to be an interconnected system uh, to deal with. The second part is talking about uh, the enhanced public realm, where it talks about creating uh, people friendly public spaces, which is applicable to different vulnerable groups and different age groups and gender uh, in the neighborhood or in the station area. But it also talks about creating a larger network of these public spaces in a way to say that is there a way we could connect all the cycle tracks and pedestrian networks to these public spaces. Which, which makes them more accessible to people of the station area. Third part, which is talking about feeder integration, where I'm saying as much as it is important to uh, have a coordinated uh, or a planned mass transit, it is equally important to have an integrated um, feeder, bus, uh, feeder systems. Uh, these feeders could be right from buses to uh, smaller auto rickshaws or it could be cycles or any of those but there is a clear integration which has which is required uh, in terms of time as well as the kind of routes uh, which are provided to these feeder systems uh, the fourth one is talking about the parking management where we are we are basically talking about regulating both um, on street and off street parking and when we talk about parking it's not just talking about parking of cars uh, and use the private vehicles, but it also is talking about the bicycle um, here, where we could focus on the aspect of public bicycle sharing and docking systems around the uh, mass transit and how we plan the whole system together. Uh, the last aspect, which is talking about enhanced safety and security, where uh, we are not talking, we're talking about security in two ways here, where the first one talks about uh, security in terms of infrastructure, where when we design different infrastructures like footpaths or, or crossings or, or, or uh, junctions, they have to be designed in a way that they are safe to different kind of users. And it also talks about safety in terms of uh, how safe is the place for you to walk or cycle. It could be done in terms of different safety measures. Uh, in terms of de introducing different security systems like cameras, or it could be as simple as introducing uh, well-lit streets through uh, uh, good lighting systems in this particular areas. 
So talking about safe access toolkit uh, from, you know, uh, transitioning from the safe access principles, uh, we use those principles to develop this safe access toolkit. And it has also been uh, a derivative from the safe access manual. And this manual is uh, actually available um, on the WRI website for everyone to download if you're interested. So uh, the toolkit is basically a platform to ideate and co-create last mile connectivity solutions around mass transit stations. So it, the aim here is to educate the participants regarding the need for safe access uh, uh, to these mass transit systems like BRT and Metro, but it also uh, deals with deriving actionable strategies. So it basically encourages the participants to actually sit down together take up certain roles in the station area and, and, and come up with different solutions for the station area in terms of the based on the principles which have uh, we have mentioned. The objectives here is to inculcate awareness about the importance of safe and equitable access and uh, you know derive implementable solutions uh, where then the participants negotiate and discuss among themselves and come up with a certain set of solutions. And it's not just about deriving these solutions. It is also about prioritizing these solutions based on the kind of need which exists in the station area. Um, and this is something which is the main thing of the whole toolkit where we have derived this interactive exercise and it's actually designed as a board game and as an interactive activity uh, where participants get to actually play this whole board game and it is not designed as as a mere presentation format so the first component is the interactive board itself um, i'm not sure if you can see all the text in this but broadly speaking uh, if you see, uh, there are five tables with different colors and each of these colors indicate the five principles of safe access, which I've mentioned earlier. And uh, towards the right side of the board, you have the station area explained and different uh, radii which exists around the station area and also a few set of rules on how to play this uh, particular activity. There is also the aspect of role play here, which becomes an important entity where each of the participant on the table when, when it's split into groups is given a different role play, be it uh, on one extreme, it is the government, government authority, women on a wheelchair, a teenager on a cycle, or it could be a grandfather, which represents different kinds of citizen uh, and the government roles which exist in the station area or the neighborhood. But it is also on the other side, these car owners and private developers, which represent the other extreme of the community where, you know, they are more focused towards the profit based approach. So the participants are given this role and they are asked to take, uh, they, they have, each of the roles have certain uh, powers as well as restrictions on how to, how they can use this particular thing. And so basically these participants have to wear a hat of this particular role and function or, or represent this particular role when they're taking certain decisions for the station area. And uh, like I explained in each of the table, uh, if I take one example of the table, there are two sets of strategies uh, which are mentioned um, in each of these principles. Whereas step one, if you see the orange and the blue dots, uh, there are each of these dots are placed under different headings, let's say pri government, private and the people. So each individual picks uh, one out of the first three strategies and one out of the second three strategies uh, and ticks up, up their particular choices individually uh, in the first stage of the activity. In the second stage of the activity where this becomes an interesting part, all the role play, all the players uh, of this particular um, uh, decision making, uh, they discuss together and they have to come to a consolidated decision to choose uh, again, again, choose one option among the first three and one option among the second three here. And this has to happen as a debate between the group where the government becomes the spokesperson and listens to all the stakeholders uh, in the group and comes with the final choice as a final collaborative choice. What is important here is as a key takeaway here is uh, it has led to uh, different kinds of outcomes. It could be, you know, deriving and prioritizing street and public uh, space usage, or it could be 
designing interventions on ground or it could be uh, leading to informing policies or even building capacities and knowledge sharing. So the tool has actually been used across different platforms leading to different kinds of outcomes. Uh, but the game itself um, actually helps to discuss and collaborate and negotiate these decision making process of safe access uh, as a as a principle. So coming down to the fact when we talk about reality check here, uh, who can use this particular tool? Uh, it could be used uh, if you're looking at doing certain on ground implementation as demonstration projects. Uh, the residents could use this. Uh, they can be a this particular exercise. It could be representative association like residents welfare associations. It could be institutional representatives like schools, colleges, hospitals, etc. Uh, and then it could be traffic and transportation transportation representatives like the traffic police and the wardens. And lastly, the elected representatives and important decision makers of the area. Uh, as a gist, it is the different uh, stakeholders of that particular station area which is chosen and someone who represents that station area and someone who can give uh, key uh, key inputs in terms of um, designing the station area. The second part is where we're talking about the capacity building where this tool can also be used to train different urban experts across cities um, around the world where it could be the urban and transport experts or the officials of the city or it could be institutions it could be the government officials or it could be the implementing agency who are actually doing uh, these kind of projects on ground uh, when we are coming down to toolkit um, uh, applications and implications to understand where we have basically used this tool and what kind of impact we have found uh, we have done this workshop in 10 plus uh, cities in India and, it, and it's still on. I, I guess the number now is about 15 workshops. And uh, in the last uh, year, we did about two international workshops in Africa and Taiwan. And, and the results were quite surprising for us as well. And if I have to uh, explain this in three categories, which is one, the on-ground implementation. Second is training the trainers. And finally, the institutional capacity building. The first example where we're talking about engagement and ground, uh, the WRI uh, uh, signed an MOU uh, with the Kochi Metro, which is KMRL. Uh, the city is in the southern part of India where uh, we were uh, assisting the, uh, the metro uh, uh, and the implementing agency agencies in that city, uh, where we initially used this tool as an icebreaker session for the city where we invited, uh, where we took up two metro stations um, in, in Kochi city and we derived the station area from there and invited all the stakeholders of that particular area be it the bus operators or the metro agencies or it could be the locals or the residents welfare associations. So all these people came together to give their inputs for the station area and, and the, the tool was strongly helpful to uh, sort of discuss and consolidate their particular inputs and opinions which actually led us to uh, give certain set of principles always as well as strategies to the Kochi Metro which they have taken it forward and now they are implement uh, introducing these principles as a part of their station area planning process. It also led us to create a complete signage and safe access audit uh, for each of these metro stations uh, and create and, and this uh, particular audit has been taken forward by the Kochi Metro and they are implementing uh, these kind of um, the, implementing our suggestions as a part of this uh, metro development and the future metro stations which are coming in. We also use this tool as a part of the STAMP program which is Station Access and Mobility Program which was an initiative uh, by WRI and the Toyota Mobility Foundation where we introduced the aspect of entrepreneurship uh, here, where uh, each of the entrepreneurs came up with different technological solutions uh, uh, for the aspect of last mile connectivity around a uh, station area. And uh, we have also been engaging uh, this uh, with different smart cities, which is uh, another initiative in the Indian context here, um, where we are using this tool to use that as a kickoff workshop for area-based uh, development work here. It is primarily uh, to uh, be applicable to different demonstration projects as a part of this uh, smart city program. 
uh, coming down to this scale up, uh, which was um, this program called Leaders in Urban Transport Program, which was uh, which we did uh, in the last year in Addis uh, City in Ethiopia. Uh, we didn't do any change uh, in the kind of strategies and or the principles or the role play in the activity and just clearly uh, use the same interactive board in the African context too. And it, it, to our surprise, we came to realize that even Africa also faces a similar kind of situation or similar kind of issues with safe access and they found this tool and the workshop to be extremely relevant to their context. And, and they not only um, accepted this as an important tool for Addis City, which is basically a tier one city uh, in Ethiopia, but they said this could be applicable for the tier two cities, which are basically secondary cities in the country. And, and, and it could be used for the whole aspect of station area planning in different cities in the African context as well. And uh, sorry, to another point to mention here, where the participants here were urban and transport officials um, across different cities in the whole of Ethiopia uh, um, who are working in different governments over there. And shifting from urban officials, uh, this was a workshop done as a part of a TUMI masterclass, which is Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative, uh, where we WRI collaborated with ECLE, GIZ, uh, as well as Wuppertal Institute and organized this workshop in, in Taiwan where uh, there were representatives primarily from uh, Southeast Asia, but also um, uh, across different other cities or countries like Philippines, Africa, and other uh, uh, the geographies over there. Uh, what we also came uh, soon realized was as much as Africa, uh, it, this whole set of principles as well as the tool and the idea of the tool is equally applicable um, as a part of South uh, East Asian context as well. They equally found that, you know, these kind of scenarios exist in these situations and hence the tool becomes important. So that was a really great learning for us that um, it's not just India which is facing these kind of situations, but also um, other cities as well. And talking about uh, building capacities within the country, this was done as a part of Amrut program, which Amrut is basically a program uh, which is uh, developed as a part from uh, Ministry of Urban Development here, which talks about um, training uh, different urban uh, and transport and uh, officials in the country. And we have been doing this for about six plus cities already, and it, it has seen a lot of success. And uh, we have trained about 150 plus urban and transport officials in the country through uh, through this program. Okay, so with, to end uh, my presentation, I wanted to summarize of what uh, summarize the part we have done. Uh, the, we did three parts. The first part was understanding transit oriented development and how uh, WRI has been uh, mainstreaming this TOD with different approaches. The three parts being the regulatory frameworks, the finance, as well as the design aspect. The second part talked about uh, the safe access to mass transit, where we try to understand what is safe access, and then the five principles of safe access, and finally, what was the need uh, for this particular tool. The last part uh, was a reality check, where we try to understand what, are, what were the different applications and implications um, of this um, safe access tool. So in conclusion, I would like to say that can we start re-looking into the idea of mass transits, not only as individual infrastructural components, but more as livable spines of the city, where can we create these as important activity generators and activity nodes of the city and not just becoming mere infrastructural entities. And can we look at safe access around mass transit as a people-oriented uh, and a collaborative approach? You know, in a way to say what I repeated earlier was, uh, can we see uh, this whole approach not just as an infrastructure where we just do a design and planning process and just get an approval for the from the government and just go ahead and implement that? Uh, instead of doing that, can we rather include people as a part of this whole decision making and and have a cohesive um, this is uh, design for the station areas. Um, this is my last slide where um, I would like to say that uh, 
this whole toolkit has been uploaded on the CityFix Learn, and it's something which you could download and see the whole process. And going forward, now that we have done enough workshop, we are trying to look for collaborating with different agencies and governments around the world. So if you think it is suitable for you, we would be more than happy to uh, collaborate as a part of this whole exercise. So let's collaborate and work together and hopefully uh, this tool uh, would be useful for you um, in be it your academic purpose or it could be your professional purpose. Um, and we really hope uh, to hear something from you in case there are any kind of collaboration required. And with that, I would like to end my um, talk and thank you. And you could write to me on this particular email. Tara, over to you. Thanks very much, Rajiv. That was that was a great presentation, a lot of information, and I know that you're just scratching the surface. Um, so thanks for keeping it within our timeline. Um, so this part of the presentation, we now turn it over to the audience um, to ask questions, and we do have one question from Terenik. I'm sorry if I said that wrong, but thank you for starting us off. Um, and your question is, where does electric micromobility fit into safe access to public transit, such as electric bikes and scooters, whether they be dockless sharing or private ownership? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I feel that definitely fits in the aspect of feeder systems we were talking about. So, um, I, I, like Terra mentioned, this is an extremely short time to get into details of each of those, but uh, um, the safe access definitely focuses on the aspect of last mile connectivity and uh, the stamp program, which I mentioned about, which was station uh, access and mobility program. That's something which we are precisely trying to do, where we are trying to engage with different entrepreneurs and startups in the city to come up with these kind of uh, new innovations and technical technological solutions in order to achieve this aspect of last mile connectivity. So uh, what um, this particular workshop or tool does is uh, try to sort of collate these kind of ideas which are uh, possible in these station areas and take it forward to different governments or implementing agencies who could possibly um, make this into a reality. So the, to answer to your question, it fits into the idea of FIDA system and integrating FIDA systems um, as a part of uh, five principles of safe access. Okay, so right now, that's the only question that we have. I have some of my own, um, but I really encourage everyone that's on the line to ask any question that arose. Um, don't be shy. We're here to have a, a bit of a conversation after the presentation. So, um, you know, don't, don't, please feel free to write in your comments. Um, so I, I have many, many questions, Rajiv, but I will um, keep to just a couple. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, I think because we have such a diverse audience, if you want to go back and just talk about more about um, the application of, of this in other cities around the world, considering that it was developed in an Asian context, but um, in, maybe you can be more specific about in what ways um, are these the same issues elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, to elaborate on that, I would like to um, el elaborate further on the African context to start with, where uh, um, our team uh, in Africa, not only uh, we, we, not, we, didn't, we didn't do this uh, workshop um, only in the LUTP program, but uh, our African team actually organized this for the local stakeholders on ground. Uh, in order to understand what are the different uh, issues as well as possible strategies around the new uh, proposed BRT um, in Ethiopia uh, or the Addis City over there. And it very soon came to realization that um, they are not only facing the issues of pedestrian uh, connectivity and access, but also in terms of feeder systems, because I have personally gone around the city over there. Um, the only way I can put this is a rich man has a rich car there, but a poor man has a poor car. Unlike in the Indian context where we have a lot of uh, use, usage of two-wheeler or the motorcycles here, uh, there it was primarily uh, the cars, the feeder systems, as well as uh, people walking on ground. So it, it does have an immense amount of complexity, but it definitely 
uh, I think has a lot of similarities to Indian context and hence at the principles also or the strategies which have been designed uh, in this whole activity, they are a lot more um, open and, and generic uh, in, in their whole uh, approach and not being very specific or contextual to one particular geography. And I think that is the strength of the whole activity or an exercise. And uh, the other part being uh, a, a little more beyond just the workshop, uh, what uh, V or WRA has been doing over time is not just engaging with cities and governments to just do this workshop as a one-time thing and just uh, stopping it there, but it is just the first step to many steps or many different kinds of outcomes which can be led to the city, uh, be it, um, let's say, implementing a street project or the safe access or the last mile project of uh, pedestrian and cycling in the cities, or it could be even training different experts or the governments in different cities. So this is just as a first step, which and beyond this, WRI even does a different kind of handholding by, by training them in specific fields, or it could be even mentoring them during the implementation process of different projects. So it, it could be uh, basically used as a tool for different kind of purposes uh, and also different kinds of outcomes. And it and this is definitely not just applicable to India, but uh, to a lot of similar geographies over there. Okay, great. So we have a, a couple more questions. Um, my Spanish is not great, but I think someone is asking for us to share the presentation. So um, just want to check in that and we will we will share this as well as the recording. Um, and if I misunderstood that, I apologize. The next question is from Juliana. And um, she asks, have you considered using the toolkit with schools to raise awareness of the complexities of transport planning, maybe adapting to children and teenagers? That's a great question. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, the only clause here is, um, I am not sure if she schools as an um, actual schools or is she talking about the, uh, the bigger institutions, let's say urban planning and urban design. I, I suppose that she's talking about actual schools, right? Schools, yeah, children and teenagers. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that's definitely um, um, in our whole planning process right now. It is in the line uh, of getting it done, but um, I would say uh, that right now we have not tried uh, in the schools per se, but we have definitely tried this in um, other kind of academic institutions like universities where uh, it, it has focused set of students in the field of urban design and urban planning and transport planning. And, uh, and, and it has worked very well because it's a very, very simple tool and uh, it is grounded to people on ground and, and it's very simple. Uh, worded in a very simple manner so definitely it has been useful for them but i i completely agree with your point that it, it could be taken forward even to the schools also and uh, to educate them to the next level and 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 this is this can actually work as a very great way to do our outreach about the aspect of safe access because they are the one who can spread the news very quickly and they are the one who can be aware about these aspects right from the early stage. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. We have in the US safe routes to school and this would be a great tool to use with the children as well as their parents and teachers in the, in the general community. Um, okay, so our next question is from Camillo and he says, thank you a lot for this interesting presentation. I want to ask at what project stage it would be recommended to apply the SAM tool would it be possible to apply the tool once the mass transit project is built? Yes, I, I that's yeah, I mean that's completely possible because uh, given um, the scenario of development across different cities, we definitely can't say that you know there can be a very uh, clean fantasy world where the whole place is empty and we're going to start from scratch. Uh, if you take any of the Asian contexts, uh, it's clear that you know a lot of mass transits are already in place, be it for the need of investments in cities where you know each of the city wants to portray itself to say that, hey, we have brought this really good mass transit, but th that has become also uh, hit the cities 
uh, in a different way to say that you know they have put in these kind of mass transit without even planning for other aspects of safe access be it the feeder systems or even developing a basic access for people to use it uh, which is creating a lot of problems for people so it it is clearly applicable to both uh, brownfield conditions where you know the mass transit is already in place and we sort of try to do that Uh, where we try to retrofit uh, different solutions on ground uh, to give you a few example uh, one or two examples it we could start working on the streets so when we talk about tod and safe access approach it's not that we have to look into reorganizing the whole development which is a very very long term approach with a span of 10 to 20 years it could just start with simple steps of even just picking streets and public spaces and reworking on that where we already have the existing space available and how do we Uh, put in new elements of streets be it footpaths or cycle tracks or it could be how do we rework on the existing public spaces uh, where they still don't have the basic amenities and 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 we make them more universally accessible so it's clearly applicable both for brownfield conditions as well as a, a greenfield condition okay um Right now, we don't have any more questions. Um, I guess it'd be it'd be useful to hear uh, if anyone is interested in in hearing more about this or potentially potentially organizing a workshop around this. Um, how could WRI help to support this? Um, and um, or what next steps would you take? I suggest them to take or do. Um. I I can answer that, but I am not. sure about the person's background but i i'll answer this in both ways um let's say you are a professional or an, an or an important part or an expert in the city where you are a part of um let's say you're an official as a part of city development uh, um or any other kind of institution uh one way to help that is we can actually um either train the officials in your city through this tool uh, in order to make uh, explain the aspects of safe access and getting more into detail because this is just the first part of the activity which i have explained the second part of the activity is actually uh, where the participants work on a station area uh, in a given station area and redesign the whole station area based on these five principles so let's say if you already have a, a metro or any kind of mass transit planned and you're planning to develop the area around that this could be the first step to make the whole process uh, uh, fit in place and we have an understanding these five principles and this can lead to different uh, strategies and solutions for that particular station area this is something which is applicable to real projects on ground and if you are a part of implementing agencies it could be done that way or uh, let's say if you're taking over the case of institutions or experts um, and, and different kind of officials in the city it could also be used as a capacity building tool where we could train uh, different trainers not only uh, to make them understand about the tool principles and different aspects involved within this but it could also be a training program where we actually teach them on how to organize this whole um, activity so they could take it forward and do it to uh, the bigger audience or the larger set of people um, and so that this could be scaled up across different parts of the whole city and it's not just about us coming and doing every single workshop and you basically you could become the participants to learn about this and you could eventually become the mentors to sort of do this workshop so it's an open tool which is available to download but it could be done uh, but it it's, it has to be done in collaboration with us okay great um okay so we have a question um they would like to know how from ya yamilka Uh, we would like to know how to manage, and that's where it ends. I don't know if you want to um, elaborate. We can actually turn your mic on, your Milka, if you wanted to ask the question. Um, yeah, even I was not too clear about that.
Yeah, Milka, your your mic is on if you wanted to say something or to type something else. Okay, well, it, um, if we don't have any other questions, I think we should be cognizant of everyone's time and, and wrap this up. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for today's session. If you're interested in our programming, you can find it at www.thecityfixlearn.org. And oh, here's the question. Let's get to it. We'd like to know how to manage the land use to enhance the public ratio in the radio in the urban station was um, with criterias. Oh, I'm sorry. Rajiv, just, is that something? I think I think maybe the best way to handle this is we will email you directly and maybe we can set up a call um, where we can discuss this in more detail. Um, so I hope you guys will stay tuned for our next webinar in the series scheduled for November 15th, where we'll delve into electric buses. Um, as you exit the webinar, please take a moment to complete the survey. Your feedback will help us to uh, deliver stronger and targeted webinars as we move forward. And if you have any questions or comments, you can email me or Valeria Hurtado directly at the email on the slide. Um, on behalf of the resource team, I'd like to thank Rajiv Malagi for his engaging presentation, Valeria Hurtado for her wonderful support on coordination and logistics of the webinar, and to the Jeff and the World Bank for making the webinar series possible. See you next time. Thanks.